ISO.org is the premier online Bible school developed by Perry Stone. ISO.org has dozens of courses, hundreds of lessons, and thousands of students all over the world. Sign up today. Welcome to Manifest, hosted by international evangelist, teacher, and author Perry Stone. Enjoy unique insight into prophetic and practical truth. It's time to feast on fresh manna, so get ready to be blessed and encouraged. And now, here is your host and teacher, Perry Stone. I want to welcome everyone to the Manifest Telecast. I'm in Tel Dan in the northern part of Israel. Behind me is the oldest gate in the world. And this is one of those very popular tourist sites when people come from around the world. So if you ever get a chance, be sure and visit the beautiful park here at Tel Dan. Today on the program, I have a very powerful message, but I want to give you an advance notice that this is going to be part one and part two. There is, especially in the West, a lot of teaching on the time coming in the future called the Great Tribulation Period. And in that teaching, there are three camps. There is called the pre-trib camp, mid-trib camp, post-tribulation camp. And basically, the seven-year tribulation is set in the Bible for seven years, divided by 42 months and 42 months, and most everyone agrees on that. However, the di difference of opinion is when does the coming of the Lord take place for the church and the resurrection of the dead in Christ take place? Now, I grew up basically when I began to study prophecy, leaning toward the pre-tribulation theory. Others, in fact, I have a gentleman on my board that's going to be on our second trip. He's one of the head of our boards. He's 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 mid-trib to the max. I've just about convinced him the other way, but not yet. But he's definitely, he's man, he's right in mid-trib. And I have a very dear friend of mine. And I mean, this man is a great minister, great friend of mine, but he's very much post-trib. And the one thing I want to say before I get started on the subject is, I do not want to argue a point, but I want to show you why I believe why I, what I believe. Then you're going to have to decide what you believe after you hear the teaching. There's four fundamental beliefs that most most evangelicals have, and I want to give those to you. Number one is the Lord is going to return. Number two is most of them believe that there is a seven-year tribulation coming. Number three, the, uh, a lot of them believe that there will be a return either, as I said a moment ago, before, in the middle, or at the end of the tribulation. And that's where the real difference of opinion comes in. So we have to uh, ask ourselves about the different theories. Now, I have taught in the past a lot about the pre-trib theory and why I believe I lean more toward pre-trib. But what I want to do today is talk about the post-trib theory. If you've never heard it, you're going to get some information you may have never heard. And I'm going to share with you a little bit. Now, I'm not saying everyone that believes post-trib believes it this way. This is a general idea. Post-trib teaches that the coming of the Lord happens at the end of the seven-year tribulation period. So let me give you probably a five or six points. The tribulation is seven years in length, and post-trib says the Lord comes at the end of the tribulation, which means that the church on earth goes through all seven years of the tribulation period. They do believe that the beheadings mentioned in Revelation chapter 20, verse 4, are the, are, are the Christians or are, is the church, that much, much of the church will be beheaded during the tribulation, that Christ will return with his angels when he comes back to earth, not with the saints. And then he will then kind of catch us up. There'll be a resurrection and immediately with in just a few seconds, we'll come back to the earth. And uh, that's when we're going to be changed is at the end of the tribulation period. And then you have to say, and this is where this is where the theory kind of, kind of falls apart to me, is that the married supper of the Lamb happens on earth at the end of the tribulation. And also the Bema, which is the judgment seat of Christ, happens on earth at the end of the tribulation. So that's kind of a synopsis of the idea of the seven years and the different aspects of what happens during the seven years with what we call the post tribulation theory. Now we have to begin by asking ourselves, let's go to the book of Revelation. And is the book of Revelation in chronological order? Some people who believe in mid and post-trib do not believe it's in an actual chronological order. They believe it goes here, then jumps back to there, and it kind of jumps back to this. However, if you look at the book of Revelation, chapter one is the vision of Jesus in heaven. Chapters two and three is the message to the seven churches of Asia. Chapter four, where John hears a voice saying, come up here to the throne of God, he then begins to see events in heaven, 
on the earth and under the earth happen during a seven year time frame. The book of Revelation is absolutely in a chronological order. And that's the reason why he divides it up into 42 months, then another 42 months or 1,260 days and another 1,260 days or three and a half years, then another three and a half years totaling seven years. And that seven years is initially found in Daniel chapter nine and verse 27, where a covenant of agreement is made with Israel along with many other nations for a period of one seven or for seven years. So this is where we get the idea of the seven years and the book of Revelation agrees with the time frame, totaling those two halves into a period of seven years. Now, having said that, you have to understand that in the book of Revelation, John says, after this, he mentions after this two times, then he mentions after these things three times, and then, and then he mentions about and after, and after he mentions that three times. So what he's doing, he's giving you a chronological order of saying, this is happening, but after this happens, this happens. If I were to say to you today, which is going to happen, now after this, we're going to Nimrod, not Nimrod's fortress, but after that, we're going to eat lunch. Is that chronological order? Yes. Okay. But uh, so in the book of Revelation, the chrono chronological order is given that after this, you'll see this, after this, you'll see this, after this, you'll see that. And that's very important when you understand that in Revelation 4 and 1, John hears a voice like a trumpet saying, come up hither. And immediately he's in the throne room. That's a picture of the saints being raised. Then at the end of the tribulation, Revelation chapter 19, after, 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 then Jesus comes back with the armies of heaven. So the book of Revelation is in a chronological order, and that's point number one that I want to make. Now, when it comes to the saints being in heaven, if the book of Revelation is in chronological order, and if it does cover seven years, which it does, then where are the saints of God during that seven years beginning in Revelation chapter, uh, let's say uh, six with the breaking of the first seal of the seven sealed book all the way to chapter 19 when Jesus, am I going too fast for you? <laughs> Not for this bunch. Now, maybe for everybody else, but this bunch keeps up with this. So in chapter four, which is the, let's say it's the coming of the Lord. Chapter 19 is the return of Christ to the earth. All right. Now, having said that, where are the saints? If we are in the tribulation, we have to be on the earth at that time. We cannot absolutely be in heaven. So there's two things happening in heaven. And I want to, I want to try to cover this the best that I can. And that is this, that the saints are in heaven in Revelation chapter 11, verse 18, and not just on the earth during that time, but in heaven at a judgment. Now, as I talk about in the Bible, the judgments that are going to happen, let me give you four judgments during this time frame. And I'm going to give these to you quickly. Number one, there are tribulation judgments taking place on the earth in Revelation 6 and 10 to avenge the blood of the martyrs and the righteous people who have died through the ages. Then we find in Revelation chapter 11, verse 18, it says the nations are angry and God then pours out his wrath upon the nations in the greater part of the tribulation. OK, so follow me carefully about the judgments. Number two, there will be a judgment of the nations in Joel chapter two that will happen in the Kidron Valley, the Valley of Jehoshaphat, and you've been there now in the city of Jerusalem. That's a second judgment that we can find in the Bible in Joel chapter two. A third judgment that we find is called the great white throne judgment. And I'm not, I'm giving these in order at this point, but I'm going to skip, I'm going to jump back in a moment. The great white throne judgment happens at the end of the 1000 year reign of Christ on the earth. And that's where Satan, demons, devils, you know, the Bible says we will judge the angels. Those are the fallen angels because the righteous angels don't need judgment. These fallen angels are going to be judged that are, that are in Peter in second Peter are bound in Tartarus in a lower chamber of hell. All the sinners of the ages will be judged at the great white throne judgment. But there's a judgment called the judgment seat of Christ, which is the Bema, the Bema judgment. Now the Bema judgment is very interesting because it's found in Revelation chapter 11 and verse 18. Now let me read this to you. It says the nations were angry that thy, and thy wrath is come in the time of the dead, that they should be judged, and that thou shouldest, um, thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, now watch this, and to the saints, and to the saints, and to them that fear your name, small and great, and you should destroy them who destroy the earth. Now notice, 
It says specifically that the saints are being judged here in Revelation 11, verse 18. Now, if post-trib is correct, it means that the judgment has to happen after Revelation 19, at the end of the tribulation, when Jesus comes back on the earth, and that's where the Bema would take place. However, this Bema or judgment for the saints is happening in Revelation 11, which is about the middle part of the tribulation period. So notice uh, some of these verses, Romans chapter 14, 9, 9 through 12. For to this end Christ died and rose and lived again, that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. But why do you judge your brother? Why do you show contempt for your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ, so each of us to give an account of himself to God. Now this, this is for believers now, not sinners. This is for believers. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 9 through 11. Therefore we make it our aim, whether to be present or absent, to be well-pleasing to God. For he, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, and each each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether it be good or whether it be bad. And this is when, this bema is when the judge, the rewards that, that the Bible talks about, that Paul talks about, Christ talks about, will be given to those who've been faithful to the Lord. Now there'll be two, two categories. Let me just say this. There will be people who will be rewarded for what they did, the work they did, the giving they did, and what they did for the kingdom. Because the Bible says, if a man's fruit remains, or if what you've done for God remains, you shall receive the reward. There's a warning in the Bible, let no man take your crown. And there will be people whose works are tried by the fire of heaven at a judgment and it won't stand. And although they make it into heaven, they make it into the kingdom, they have no reward because they did nothing on earth. Look, I see church people who do nothing for God. Amen. They come on Sunday morning, they don't give, they fuss about giving, but they, you know, they're saved. They love the Lord. They talk, they t they'll talk about him, but they do nothing. They don't do missions. They don't help. They don't support. They don't volunteer. Well, they have no reward. Now, how can somebody take my crown in heaven or your crown in heaven? Someone will take your crown if you were assigned to do something for God and you did not do it and somebody took your place. Let's say God called me to teach children's ministry and I love kids, but I say, you know what? I'm working so much and I got to make money and get my kids through school. Then she, God let, lets her do the whole children's church for 30 years I would have done. She gets my crown. Everything God would have given me, she ends up getting. I end up with nothing. And I heard somebody say to me one time, they said, well, you know what? I don't care if I get a crown or not as long as I make it there. Do you understand something that if you go to heaven and have no crown and everybody else does, everybody's going to look at you and say, boy, what a, what a failure. <laughs> No, you know what I mean? They're going to say, man, that, that God bless them, but they didn't do nothing for God on earth. I mean, and here's the thing. The only thing you have to give back to the Lord in heaven is when those elders are taking their crown and casting them before him. Think about this. The only thing you have to give back to him is the crown and present it and say, thank you, Lord, for what you've given me. You understand what I'm saying? So you don't, you don't want to be, this is what the Bible said. Don't be ashamed at his appearing. And you will be ashamed of his appearing if you did nothing for him. And you say, oh boy, I spent my whole life working 25 hours, you know, 25 hours a day to make money and died and didn't left it all behind him. My kids are fussing about it, you know? Anyway, I always tell people, leave your kids something when you're about to die, but go to all those Perry Stone conferences and spend as much as you can. You know, I have a, I have a, I gotta say this real quick. I have a ministry partner named Ron Rowe, been with us for years, and he used to tell his family, and they're, they're Christian kids. He said, look, I'm leaving you something, but Perry Stone, I'm going to all his conferences, so I'm spending a lot of your inheritance. <laughs> you know, by traveling and going, and just the hotels and the meals, I mean, they just had, they had a great time. So, uh, you know, I hope you receive that as in the intent as I said it. So, now watch this. If, if we believe in post-trip, then we have to get our rewards on earth. Now, this is the verse post-trip people, uh, people often use. Uh, um, Henceforth, there is later for me a crown of righteousness with the, well, let me go back. Let me go back. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you these three verses first. Henceforth, there is later for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but to unto all of them who love his appearing. First Peter four and five, who shall give an account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead. Now the quick and the dead means the living and the dead. Those who are alive when he comes are going to be caught up and changed in the moment, twinkling of an eye, and the dead are going to be raised and resurrected. First Peter five and four, and when the chief shepherd shall appear, you, when he shall appear, if I say appear, because that's appear, appear. Yeah. when the chief shepherd shall appear, then you shall receive a crown of glory that fades not away. So when do we get the reward? When he appears. 
Now, the repairing is, a, we, I'm going to use a term, some of you don't like it too bad. Um, um, the rapture. When he comes for the rapture, the catching away, we will go and stand at the beam of Revelation 11, 18, receive a reward. And that happens. We can't get the reward until he first appears to catch us up into heaven. Now, post-tribulation, however, would believe that when the Lord comes, his reward is with him because it says in Revelation chapter 22 and 12, you know, uh, that when he returns, his reward is with him. So we say, oh, okay. So when Jesus comes back, he's bringing our, re our reward with him. No, no, no. It says he his reward is with him, not our reward is with him. Can you imagine Jesus coming back on a white horse dragging 15 trillion crowns behind him? I'm on some old horse, you know, please, I know, I know half of you don't believe in Santa Claus. I don't either. He's just a, he's just a figment. I know that. But can't you believe like Santa's sled, like the movie, that movie they watch every year? What is that called? Um, the train and the, the kid that gets on the train. But Paul looks, can you, you remember when Santa gets on the big sled and it burns? Yeah. Can you imagine Jesus pulling a white horse with a big bag and it's got a trillion crowns behind it? You know, he's losing a few along the way in the atmosphere. I'm not trying to be facetious, but I'm saying that your reward is when he appears and your reward is given in heaven and your reward, according to Paul, is at the Bema. And the Bema, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Revelation 11, 18 is in the middle, not the end of the seven year tribulation period. Now, this does not necessarily promote post-trib, I'm sorry, mid-trib, because it just happens in the middle of the tribulation because you've got to go in heaven and worship the Lord for a period of time in Revelation chapter 5. I'm not going too fast for you. Okay. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for behold, great is your reward in heaven. For in like manner did the fathers, did they persecute the fathers and to the prophets? Luke chapter 6, verse 23. James 1 and 12, endure temptations and testing and you will, you will receive a crown. My point is that when you look at what the scripture has to say, and this is a really good verse, rejoice for great is your reward where? In heaven. Great is your reward in heaven. heaven. So in other words, where's our reward? Not on the new earth, not in the millennial reign. Our, what, what, ha what happens on the new earth in the millennial, I'm sorry, what happens in the millennial reign, the 1,000 year reign of Christ is that he has told us what we're going to do in heaven. You're going to be a leader. You're going to be over cities. That's in the parables. So we do that when we return to earth, but our rewards of what we're getting, our positions in the millennial kingdom are determined in heaven at the Bema and the judgment seat for our faithfulness to the Lord on earth. Now, what is the judgment, however, that happens on earth because there is a judgment? I charge thee before God and before the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead, watch this, at his appearing and at his kingdom. The judgment for the appearing is for the believers. The judgment in the kingdom is for the earth. And that's where we get to Joel chapter 2, which where it talks about that in the valley of Jehoshaphat, he will judge all nations. So there is a judgment for the nations that happens in his kingdom. So let me, let me I, know, I know for a lot of you, this is a very, 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 very heavy overload. And it really is. But Joel chapter 3, verse 12, let the heathen be awakened, come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there he, I will sit and judge all of the heathen round about. So why is there a judgment needed when Jesus returns to the earth? Here's why. Many people have received the mark of the beast, and there will be some, believe it or not, that are able, miraculous, to survive without the mark. This is the separation of the wheat and the tare, which Jesus mentioned in Matthew 13, where he sends his angels to separate the wheat from the tare. So the, the tare will be the children of the Satan who have followed the beast, the false prophet, and the Antichrist, who will be taken off of the earth. And this is all in the parables and the stories of the New Testament. But those who survive will be those that the Bible says he shall gather his angels to co collect his elect from the four corners of the earth. So there'll be two groups of people. There'll be people who accepted the mark, worship the beast. And in the book of Revelation, it plainly tells you, tells you don't take the mark, don't worship the beast because it's really the mark of doom. So the people who have the mark of the beast, who've worshiped the beast, wor follow the Antichrist, are not permitted to rule on earth for a thousand years with Jesus. They have to be separated during the separation of what the parable says is the wheat and the tare. The wheat is the children of God. The tares are the kingdom or the 
children of Satan. And so at the end of the tribulation, this judgment happens here on earth where there is a great separation between those two particular people. Now, I'm almost out of time. I can't believe it, but let me say this to you. In Revelation chapter 19, 7 through 9, you're going to have to read this on your own. There is a marriage supper of the Lamb, and that marriage supper happens in heaven, and it happens the last year of the tribulation period because... In the Old Testament, when you were married, you took one year off with your brand new bride and you did no work. So the tribulation goes on for seven years, yes, but the last year of the tribulation on earth is the year of the married supper in heaven because every seventh day is a, is a Shabbat. Every seventh year is a Shemitah. Every seven times seven is a Jubilee. So when you get to seven, it's always rest. It's always no work. So in heaven, we've worshiped. We've gone to the judgment. And you know, that's going to take a while. But then we get to the last year when the tribulation's on earth. What are we doing in heaven? We're eating for a year. Oh, I know y'all will be happy when that happens. <laughs> I'm telling you, look, all the Baptist folks out there, I learned a long time ago, Pentecostals can out eat you people. <laughs> I'm not going to go any further than that. So I always told somebody, the Baptists are going to be uh, coming to the marriage supper and the Pentecostals will have eaten everything that's already at the table. <laughs> that's what's going to happen. But not really. I'm just kidding. But my point is this. You do see in Revelation chapter 19, 7 through 9, a marriage supper in heaven. We're given white garments. That's our, that's our celebration with Christ for the last year of the tribulation on earth. We're in heaven. Then in Revelation 19, 17, 17 through 19, there's something called the supper of our great God, of which the flesh of the captains and, and kings are eaten on the earth by the birds. Now, I had a guy tell me, that's the marriage supper. I said, look, there ain't no marriage supper I'm going to with a bunch of ravens eating flesh, okay? That is not the marriage supper of the Lamb. And people get this thing all mixed up. There is a supper of God on earth, which is a metaphor for the destruction of the armies of the Antichrist, but there is a marriage supper that happens in heaven. Now, boy, I wish I had more time because I'm out of time and I still got more to tell you, but here's the bottom line that when you look at the book of Revelation, there is a marriage supper in heaven. There is a bema in heaven. What that means is that there cannot be a coming of the Lord at the end of the seven-year tribulation because those things are happening in heaven and the saints are being rewarded in Revelation 11, 18. Now, if you try to squeeze the book of Revelation and make 11, Revelation 11, 18 the end of the tribulation, but you can't do that because it's in chronological order and it still has that 42 months over here, another 42 months over there. So you can't, you can't force it into what you want. So uh, this is part one, and we're going to do part two next week of this. I haven't gone through all of it. I've only gone through part of it, and I'm going to share with you some of my, and I shouldn't even say it this way, but debate notes of people that want to not, not argue, but debate. The, we're going to give the points of that, what they believe, what I believe, and this is going to be a great teaching next week. Now, always on Manifest, we have an offer, and this is the only way, ladies and gentlemen, the only way that you can help us stay on the air around the world is through helping us with these offers or donations. So watch this right now. We'll be right back in just a moment. Thank you for joining me on the telecast today. Greetings, everyone. I'm at my office at ISO, the International School of the Word, our Internet Bible School, to present to you the Old Testament commentary. I've been telling you about this for 10 years. It is now printed. It is now available right here on the Manifest Telecast. Let me talk to you a little bit about this. This comes from 170,000 hours of my personal Bible study. It comes from 35 to 36 years of personal notes that I have made. In this Bible, what we decided to do was print it the same color as our New Testament on the inside, which is teal green with black ink. The commentary is on the bottom, and this is a commentary of the entire Old Testament now, all 39 books. Then we have nugget boxes, and then we have in the back, in-depth articles, for example, in Genesis include Jerusalem, the center of the Garden of Eden. What about the mystery of giants and the origin of evil spirits? That's in this Bible. What about the in-depth that talks about who is Melchizedek? You know, when we did the book of Job, people editing it said that it was one of the most unique and detailed and most interesting studies on Job that they had read in any commentary that had ever been put together. And of course, we give God the glory for that. Now, what I'd like for you to do is order this Bible as we only have 39,000 copies. So the first 39,000 people who watch the Manifest telecast can get this Bible. Once again, it is 500,000 word commentary, a 1611 King James Bible printed with the best paper, top quality ink, hand stitched with a beautiful chestnut cover. And we call it the Perry Stone Hebraic Prophetic Study Bible because the notes center on prophecy, 
and Hebrew Nuggets as well. The offer number is on the screen and we ask for a $150 donation or more. And believe me, that's a real bargain for what you're getting with the information and revelation of 39 years of study. You're gonna benefit from this. You can order three ways. 1-888-21-BREAD, which is our toll-free number. You can go to perrystone.org, or you can send $150 or more donation to the Voice of Evangelism Ministry and write at Perrystone PO Box 3595, Cleveland, Tennessee 37320. It's now time to get this Old Testament commentary. You've heard me talk about it for 10 years, and now it's available. We're looking forward to you getting your copy. All right, folks, now as you know, a brand new offer, our very thick Old Testament commentary that I personally worked on, commentary with, uh, in, uh, well, you saw, you saw the advertisement there, so I don't need to rehash that, but order it by calling our office, going online at perrystone.org, or you can, you can mail us the information and request it uh, with that amount. Uh, it's a very expensive project to do, but I'm so glad it's completed, and I'm so glad the people are being blessed. Thank you for your comments, and to God be all the glory only, because it is His Word, and what we've learned over these 44 years of ministry we want to share with you. Well, anyway, let me talk to you very quickly. Okay, Texas folks, I'm coming back to Huntsville, Texas, on August 16th and 17th, Friday and Saturday, and also Sunday the 18th, uh, which will be at the Willis Campus. I'm going Friday, August the 23rd, to the North Georgia Camp Meeting, Sharpsburg, Georgia, South Metro Ministries. That's one service only. Ormond Beach, Florida, Calvary Christian Center on Friday, August the 30th. It's the Shake the Nations Ministry with Evangelist Nathan Morris. I'm only preaching one service, however. Healing Place Church on September the 1st, which is all day Sunday. That's in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And one more, the Redlands Church IPHC. And that is uh, in Advanced North Carolina, uh, September 6th, 7th, and 8th. You need to go to our website to get all the detailed information on that. Uh, so, we're looking forward to that coming to Tommy Bates Church on September the 9th. So many things going on that it's impossible in just uh, the telecast to share all those places with you that we're going to. So I'm asking you to go to perrystone.org, check out the itinerary. Uh, you know, there's a lot of things happening globally at this particular point, And I want to say something that's very interesting from the prophetic perspective. Now, we're talking, uh, we're doing a series called Countering the Post-Tribulation Theory 1 and 2. Now, I do not argue with people over when they believe that Christ will return for the church. There is pre-trib, mid-trib, and post-trib. Now, what I will do, however, is share a position that I believe based on putting all the information together, not one or two little proof texts here, but putting all the information together. And, uh, you know, I studied the subject uh, for a long time, actually, since I was a teenager at age 16. And so I'm not stuck in one, you know, some people get stuck in a, what they believe and they won't come out of it no matter what you show them. And I've always been open to other people's opinions, but I do believe strongly. And I mean, to, I mean to tell you now, we've looked at this about, you know, the seventh trumpet in Revelation is the seventh angel and all this kind of stuff that people say, you know, and the elect is the church in Matthew 24. I mean, we've, we've, we've answered all these uh, particular questions. I know that we did a series on uh, the revelation of rapture and the book of Revelation that's at our school at ISO.org. You can check that out if you want to, but just the rapture teaching was 10 hours of teaching to prove that. And so we're not here to try to beat people over the head with what we believe. What we're trying to do is show people why we believe what we believe. So I want you to be sure and watch next week, part two of this, because all the programs that we said earlier are very important, brand new prophetic teaching that we recently did in Israel. So do that. Now remember, check out our Bible school at ISO.org, our ministry at Perry Stone org follow us on social media and we want to get the word out to you and that's our goal in life is to reach as many people as we can with the gospel of jesus christ part two coming up next week and don't you miss it perry stone invites you to join him for his 2019 israel tour the dates are november 25th through december 4th with an optional visit to petra in the country of jordan call 1-888-321-3629 or visit perrystone.org for more information and how to register Seating is limited, so call today. Expand your understanding of Scripture. Advance your effectiveness in ministry. Earn certification for your knowledge of the Bible. International School of the Word. Developed by Perry Stone and Dr. Brian Cutshaw, ISO.org is the premier online Bible school 
dozens of courses, hundreds of lessons, and thousands of students all over the world. Sign up for one of our exciting, affordable Bible courses and begin your journey at iso.org today.